In order to understand what changes can occur in our brains when we are exposed to early life trauma, we need to firstly understand what happens within the typically developing brain. Whilst there is still plenty more for us to learn, advances in neuroscience over the recent years means we're developing an ever-increasing understanding of the human brain and how it develops over our lives. Starting at the very beginning, we know that babies are born with all the necessary brain structures already in place. They also have almost all of the neurons, the raw material of the brain, that they will ever have. This equates to 87 billion neurons. These neurons are created before birth and over the course of childhood, they migrate to form the various parts of the brain that control different functions. As the brain develops, connections or synapses between these neurons are created, forming pathways that connect the different parts of the brain so that they can all work and communicate effectively with each other. Over time, and in response to different experiences, these connections are then either strengthened and maintained if they're useful to us, or they're discarded if not. We know that the pattern of this process is both sequential and hierarchical in that different areas, and therefore different functions within the brain, mature at different stages. And that goes from the bottom upwards and from the back forwards. So as such, the first areas of the brain to be fully mature and connected are the brainstem and the midbrain areas. It's vital that these areas are fully developed at birth because they govern bodily functions that are necessary for life and allow us from birth to breathe, eat, sleep, see, hear, smell, make noises, feel sensations and activate our nervous system to respond to threat or danger in order to promote our survival. Higher regions of the brain remain relatively primitive at birth and they include the emotional or limbic system within the brain and the thinking area or what we call the prefrontal cortex. This is the area of our brain behind our forehead. These areas control how we process and respond to emotional material as well as control functions such as decision making, planning and attentional skills. These areas develop over our childhood so that by the time we reach adolescence we have a more sophisticated emotional and thinking brain alongside those more primitive areas. They're not however fully mature until we reach our late 20s and at this stage of development these two areas are not yet fully connected and working together. And that can explain why we might see teenagers struggling perhaps to make good decisions or manage impulsive behaviours or control risk-taking behaviours. And it can explain the emotional roller coaster of the teenage years and some of their behaviours that come from this. During adolescence, the teenage brain also undergoes a process of huge reorganisation, maintaining and strengthening those connections that are being used regularly and discarding those that are not needed. And this is known as a process called pruning. And it prepares the brain for the final stages of maturation. Until that time, however, we're functioning very much with a brain that's still under construction. Whilst brain development is certainly influenced by our genetics, we also know that it's largely influenced by our environment and our experiences. This means that the world around us is a key factor in how our brains are shaped and how they develop over the course of our childhood. Because the process of maturation is ongoing until adulthood, it also means that there's the opportunity until that time for any deviation from the typical pattern of development that, that may arise maybe from adverse childhood experiences to be corrected and for brain development to essentially get back on track, providing the right stimulation and the right environment is being provided to encourage and facilitate this. So for example, our brains prepare us to expect certain experiences by forming the pathways needed to respond to those experiences. To illustrate this, we know that our brains are wired to respond to the sound of speech and the more we're spoken to as young babies, the stronger their related synapses or connections become. If exposure to speech is not provided in early development, however, the pathways developed in anticipating this may be discarded. We also know that our brains need certain experiences in order to be able to develop healthily and optimally. These include having the right nutrition and diet, exercise and an appropriately stimulating environment. It also includes the experience of a healthy relationship or attachment with attuned and sensitive caregivers. As such, the capacity and the desire to form emotional relationships 
is again a genetic predisposition, predisposition that we are born with, but it's also related to the organisation and functioning of specific brain regions. These systems develop in infancy and within the first few years of life, making this time really critical in terms of exposing a child to healthy and positive interactions in order to really promote healthy brain development. These would include experiences of things like holding, kissing, smiling, gazing, talking to, playing and feeling safe. If any of these experiences are disrupted or they're absent for any reason, the brain will instead adapt to the less optimal environment that's provided for that child just as readily as it would to those that are optimal. We're going to learn more about what these adaptations and changes are in lesson number two of this course. But first, to finish this lesson, we're going to think about what happens in the typically developing brain when we're exposed to stress, assuming that healthy development has occurred as outlined previously. To understand this, we need to focus on a part of the brain that is closely tied to our emotions, the amygdala. This is an ancient brain structure from which most of our primitive feelings and reactions come from. So our experiences of fear, anger, anxiety, pleasure, panic, for example, all originate in our amygdala. It's in this part of the brain that emotions are given meaning. They're remembered and they're attached to associations and responses. Crucially, it's also the part of the brain that ensures our survival when under threat and in order to do so, communicates closely with another part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, where rational thought takes place to determine collectively our best response to a given situation. When that situation is stressful or dangerous, our sympathetic nervous system firstly releases specific hormones into the bloodstream including, amongst others, the stress hormone cortisol. This activates our amygdala, our first responder to the event. Once activated, the amygdala triggers the release of another hormone, adrenaline, and communicates with information being processed within the frontal cortex, using sources from all of our senses to determine which response is most appropriate to achieve the desired outcome to the situation. This is a genetically programmed response that has evolved to allow humans to survive dangerous and life-threatening situations. It tells us how big is the threat. So is it something that we can feel that we can run from, in which case our brain might initiate our flight response? Is it something we can defend ourselves against, thus initiating our fight response? Or do we judge that the only way to survive this is to essentially play dead, thus initiating our freeze response. Depending on which response is triggered, our heart rate changes as does our breathing, we can perhaps feel cold or clammy and often experience that sense of dread or foreboding. As the source of the stress passes, however, the stress hormones get switched off and our amygdala is deactivated and is calmed. A further hormone called THP is also then released that essentially acts like a tranquilizer. It calms the brain from the effects of these other hormones. Hopefully, this process is short-lived and the brain returns to a state of calm and safety relatively quickly without any long-term impact, with normal service being resumed. However, we know that exposure to stress is not always short-lived. It can be prolonged and it can be severe and it can have a very profound impact on us emotionally, psychologically and neurologically. In lesson two of this course, we're gonna think about this in more detail and specifically learn about the changes that can occur in our brains if we are subjected to adverse childhood experiences and prolonged stress and trauma. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson and I look forward to you joining me for lesson number two.